Welcome to Business Trip, a podcast about psychedelic entrepreneurship. Psychedelic medicine is transforming mental, physical, and spiritual health, and entrepreneurship will be key to expanding access. Business Trip explores the business models and origin stories of the most interesting companies in psychedelics. I'm Greg Kubin. In today's episode, we're doing things a bit differently. It's actually hosted by my Business Trip co-creator, Matthias Serebrinsky, and it features a panel of experts to discuss Atai Life Sciences and break down their S1, which is a disclosure they filed in anticipation of their upcoming IPO. Matthias, can you set the stage? Thanks, Greg. I'm usually working behind the scenes and letting Greg take all the limelight, but that is about to change. Jokes aside, I am super excited to step in as a host and let our panel of guests go deep into Atai Life Sciences. Atai is a psychedelic company with the highest number of drug development programs. They create companies from scratch, incubate, and acquire majority stakes in drug development companies. Their programs include drugs such as ibogaine, ketamine, kratom, and MDMA derivatives. Their last financing round valued them at $2 billion, and it is expected that once they go public, it will become the largest psychedelic company in capitalization. Quick disclosure, the investment syndicate that Greg and I lead is an investor in Atai. In this episode, we analyze Atai's S1 with a panel of experts. An S-1 is a long registration form required by the Securities and Exchange Commission before a company goes public. The S-1 provides information on the uses and sources of capital proceeds, business model, competition, and risks that a company is facing and will face in the future. You could say we're doing this episode because I didn't really want to read the S-1, so I asked some experts to break it down for us. I'll be analyzing the S-1 with Michael Heiken, a doctor of pharmacy and co-founder of the Psychedelic Pharmacists Association, which is a nonprofit focused on advancing psychedelics as medicines. Let's just say Michael knows a thing or two about drugs. They made the decision to go with S-ketamine as opposed to R-ketamine based on some preclinical evidence, but now it's appearing that R-ketamine might actually be a superior molecule. The second panelist is Graham Pechenik. He's the founder of Calix Law, a firm providing legal guidance to businesses in the cannabis and psychedelic spaces. Graham is a patent attorney with degrees in biochemistry and cognitive neuroscience. He will help us dive into the legal nuts and bolts of the psychedelic medicine industry. A deuterated compound is still potentially capable of receiving successfully patent protection. And finally, Josh Hartman is the guy with the British accent and the business know-how. He's a creator and editor of Psilocybin Alpha, a website providing analysis of the psychedelic medicine sector. Josh is also a senior associate at Noetic Fund, a psychedelic medicine VC. As time goes on and these drugs move through the respective phases, there will be more of a focus, not just on marketing, but also on cost effectiveness. Oh, and as a reminder, the content on this episode and all other episodes is for informational purposes only, and it does not constitute financial or investing advice. Let's get to the panel. I start off chatting with Josh of Salocybin Alpha for a few minutes about a tie and the space. And now to the episode. Josh, Graham, Michael, welcome to Business Trip. Super excited to have you here. We are going to break down Atai's S1 and use this as an excuse to just cover one of the most significant companies in psychedelic medicine. Why don't we start by chatting about why they focused on mental health and what they talk about in the S1? Yeah, so I think the focus on mental health is not necessarily specific to a tie. We see it a lot in the entire psychedelic medicine sector. Besides being one of the biggest global burdens in terms of diseases, it's also very close to most people's hearts. So I think everyone on the Atai team has made public statements about having some personal connection to people with mental health disorders, whether personally within their family or their network. But also in terms of a total addressable market, these are huge indications. So uh, anxiety, PTSD, depression, these are enormous uh, burdens on on the the global economy, both through direct treatment costs, but also loss of productivity. So companies like Atai are looking at this not only from 
the, the ability to impact the world in a positive light, but you know, they're also thinking in terms of these markets. And that's evidenced as well through the focus on opioid use disorder, which again, you know, has strong connections to mental health, but it's a distinct market in itself. So I think, you know, the ability to tackle these huge markets, like in the field of oncology, we see similarly large markets. I think that really drives the focus on mental health there. Yeah, and I guess that one question that I get asked so many times is the why now? Why start the tie now and not 10 years ago, 20 years ago? I think in terms of why now, that there's been a total stagnation in research into mental health in terms of more mechanistic models. So we saw the SSRI in the 80s and 90s. And since then, since the SSRI antidepressants, we haven't seen any real innovation. There hasn't been a breakthrough product or drug that, that really treats mental health diseases in such a broad way that SSRIs were applied. So I think, you know, there's an enormous appetite on behalf of insurance companies and national healthcare systems, but also regulators. And I think that explains why we've seen these breakthrough therapy designations for psychedelics, which was unthinkable, you know, for the last 50 years under the war on drugs. But now there's just such an enormous need and appetite that we're seeing, you know, very disruptive new types of, of drugs and medicine being explored. So one of the uh, interesting things about a tie is the fast timeline since when it was started till now. So basically since it's... Um foundation until their IPO and everything that happened in between. Josh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think that's kind of testament to how the funders and the backers of Atai are really fundraising machines in themselves. You know, beyond an interest in the field, they all come from serious investment backgrounds. So it's backed by Peter Thiel, Mike Novogratz, and, and Christian Angermeyer, all three of which come together in terms of their, their involvement in crypto, weed stocks, space exploration, longevity. So kind of wacky sectors, but the three of them kind of came together originally to invest in Compass Pathways. So a tie was kind of the genesis of a tie was really to invest in Compass. The story is that Mike Novogratz spoke to Christian Angermeyer, told him, you've got to meet George and Ekaterina, the founders of Compass Pathways. You know, these two wacky Brits who are looking to commercialize psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. And within 50 minutes of speaking to them, the story goes, Christian Angermeyer decided that he wanted to invest. He then pulled together Mike and, and, and Peter Till to, to invest in Compass. And, and that's where the seed round started. So that's kind of how it started, right? It was an investment vehicle. Today, it's more of an operating company. But that, that kind of ability to raise capital from a seed round of 3.6 million in 2018 through to their Series D of 157 million just a couple of months ago. So we've seen between those different series of fundraising, approximately 294 days between each round. And that's versus you know, a standard cadence of series of fundraising of 700 days. And it's only accelerating lately. So I think Atai, one of their key abilities is to raise funds and they have the backing of these hugely wealthy individuals who are willing to bet on risky industries. That's obviously a benefit. Other people might look at it and say, you know, these folks are just looking to invest in Vanguard and exciting sectors and, and maybe they'll hop off on, onto the next sector. So, you know, that's that's either a pro or a con, whichever way you look at it. Yeah, one thing that uh, caught my attention about the S1 is that there are only three entities that have over 5% of equity in the company. And one of them is Christian's family office at Hiron. And the other one is Galaxy Financial, which is Mike Novogratz's family office as well. So that early involvement that Mike Novogratz had actually you know, it paid off in today's equity in the company. Another interesting question that we got asked many times is why, at least on NASDAQ, you have most companies in psychedelic medicine that are listing in a couple Canadian stock exchanges, but they chose to list on NASDAQ. I don't think people are choosing not to list on the NASDAQ. I think you know most of these companies, especially in North America and Canada, would love to be on the NASDAQ. I see press releases every other week, it seems, of small cap public companies in the psychedelic space claiming that they've initiated the process of uplisting on the NASDAQ. Sadly, it's not that simple. Uh, you already have to have a certain scale. Uh, you have to have a certain operating history to be able to be eligible to even list on the NASDAQ. So we saw the MindMed uplisting, obviously. That took a while, but ultimately they're one of the biggest companies in the space, so they're eligible for that. The Compass Pathways listing was similar, right? They, they had already raised a certain amount of capital. The share price was, you know, it wasn't a penny stock. It was above a certain share price requirement. So I think, you know, the listing on the NASDAQ is just testament to their scale. They've been around longer. You know, they were formed in 2018, which is longer than a lot of the other companies in the space. And really, the reason we see so many companies listing in Canada on exchanges like the CSE and the TSXV is, is just the legacy of the cannabis industry. 
there's a lot of shell companies left over from mining exploration in Canada that are very easy to have a reverse takeover transaction with. And that's ultimately why we see so many of them in Canada. It's just a very cheap and easy way to go public via an RTA, a reverse takeover. So I think this is just kind of signaling the development and the maturity of the space that we're now going to have three companies publicly listed on the NASDAQ, which is a senior exchange, you know, one of the most prestigious in the world. So let's chat a little bit about a Thai's business model. One of the first things that I mentioned in the S1 is that they consider themselves a platform company. And that's that's quite unique, right? It's not uh, your typical psychedelic medicine company in a way. Let's break down a little bit what that means. What does it mean that a Thai is a platform company? So unlike other companies in the space, Atai provides kind of a platform. It's a decentralized model. So they provide shared services at the Atai level. So things like project management, financial support and advice. Uh, and then the underlying companies, the kind of programs themselves, they do the actual drug development and discovery and development. And even beyond that, Atai itself acquires and operates enabling technologies. So these could be things from digital therapeutics, like AI-based drug discovery, right through to Intelligence, which is a company that looks at drug delivery mechanisms like oral films. So Atai is kind of aggregating these services at the Atai level, and each of the underlying programs is operated as a company in itself. So it's a really unique model compared to other biotech companies. There are some comparators in biotech, but certainly not really in the psychedelic space just yet. Michael, any examples of companies outside psychedelics that are taking this approach? Yeah, so to Josh's point, what Atai is doing is a fairly unique business model, but there are some examples outside of the psychedelic sector. So two that come to mind are Bridge Bio, which is a platform with various gene therapies and cancer drugs. And the other one, which is perhaps a more appropriate comparison, is Pure Tech Health. So they specialize in psychiatry and immunology, and they do have some overlap with Atai. One of Pure Health Tech's ventures is related to schizophrenia, and Atai similarly has a drug that's targeting an aspect of schizophrenia. And even more comparable is Pure Tech Health's investment in digital therapeutics. So they actually have an equity stake in Achille Therapeutics, which was the company that developed the first ever video game approved by the FDA as a treatment of ADHD. Some listeners might be familiar with Achille because it was developed by Adam Gazzali out of UCSF in Neuroscape, where Robin Carhart Harris has now formed a new research center for psychedelics. So that's probably the closest comparison to a Thai's platform. But again, it is a fairly unique model. Yes, and, and that model has proven to be quite successful for Bridge Bio, as an example, right? Like I think their market cap is north of $7 billion right now. Josh, one interesting thing that Atai mentioned in their S1 is their investment criteria. I'm curious if you want to chat about that. I think a, you know, a really interesting thing when you look at the S1 is a key part of their investment criteria when looking at you know, new opportunities and, and new in-process R&D to acquire is that they like it when there's pre-existing human trial evidence uh, of efficacy. And, and not just trial, it can be anecdotal. So for example, if we look at Demirex, they're looking at Ibogaine and, and Noribogaine, and they're looking to get a 506B fast track designation from the FDA because of the, the wealth of evidence that already exists of ibogaine and its use and its efficacy in substance use disorders. GABA Therapeutics is perhaps the most striking here. They're looking to commercialize a deuterated version of etifoxine, which is an anxiolytic and an anticonvulsant and anxiety medication that's actually already sold and used in, in about 40 countries. Uh, and they're looking to use it for a generalized anxiety disorder indication. So they're not only looking to repurpose the drug, they're actually looking to deuterate it and then use it for the same indication. And again, in M Empath Bio, which is another one of Atai's underlying programs, is looking to look at empathogenic compounds, so derivatives of empathogens like MDMA. And that's relying on MAPS's phase three data in the S1. That's what's cited to identify the underlying efficacy, the, the evidence of the underlying efficacy of MDMA-like molecule. So all of these programs I've just mentioned and, and most of the other programs, if you actually look at them, they're relying on quite a lot of third-party data and pre-existing evidence, which is really interesting when you think about the broader space, because there seems to be kind of a, a rush amongst other companies in the space to identify white space, so areas that haven't been developed, molecules that haven't been looked at, and indications that are going unnoticed. So this kind of really flies in the face um, of, of the prevailing attitude, whereas Atai is looking at stuff that's already been explored. So I think it brings up you know, interesting debates going on in the space as well, as well as being an interesting business model. And I guess that also presents a few trade-offs from IP perspective. Graham, do you want to share your thoughts around kind of like the risks and rewards of a tight approach? Yeah, thanks for that question. And maybe before starting, I can just circle back to one of the things that Michael said, which was the great expense of running clinical trials 
on these products. And you know, one of the benefits, of course, of taking or trying to take something to market that's already been proven out on like edofoxine is they've you know, de-risked a lot of that early clinical work, similar to the way just bringing psychedelic compounds to market themselves has a lot of benefits in terms of reduced costs, because we know based on hundreds or thousands of years of potentially use of some of these compounds that they are safe and you know, fairly well tolerated in, in most humans. From an IP perspective, actually, I think edofoxine and the other deuterated compound, nitrogenine, that a tie is working with are, are really good examples of a strategy that actually many companies are taking to be able to take that de-risking of uh, a clinical program, but yet still be able to get patent protection for a compound. So for each of these, of course, we know that they're not patentable in and of themselves because they've already been used. However, the, the deuteration itself creates a new chemical entity that can actually be patented and receive a very strong patent protection of a composition of matter patent. So we'll probably talk more when we get to some of the ties other programs about how some of these patents are just covering methods of use that are going to be a little bit weaker because they're covering something more specific, but with a composition of matter patent, it covers all use of something. So deuteration, maybe just to back up a step, it's replacing a hydrogen on a compound with a heavier isotope. It's just a hydrogen with another neutron. It does have some changes in the pharmacokinetics. It generally increases the half-life. Often it results in less toxic metabolites. But the FDA has actually approved another deuterated compound back in 2017. And there was still some sort of open questions about whether the FDA would approve a product like that and would give it data exclusivity. And actually, the FDA agreed that that compound presented a new active moiety, which was the requirement for a new chemical entity, which meant that it got five years of data exclusivity. So it's, it's really it's the same compound as already was marketed for many years. But by being deuterated, it presented a new chemical entity. And that's also something that's true now at the patent office. So this actually is a fairly common strategy for pharmaceutical companies. The patent applications that a tie had, I think there could have been some greater controversy whether or not they would be strong and, and, and whether they would be approved for some of the pending ones. Interestingly, actually, the day we're recording today, Small Pharma, which has a deuterated DMT compound, just received in the UK a notice of allowance, basically a recognition from the patent examiner that they're going to grant the patent application. So this is something that you know indicates that a deuterated compound is still potentially capable of receiving successfully patent protection. What is the difference between composition of matter and data exclusivity? And uh, why would a company prefer to go with composition of matter? Sure. Well, the biggest difference really is the length of time that one gets exclusivity. So for data exclusivity, that length of time is only going to be five years from approval. It's a little bit longer in some other countries. So five years in the US, in the EU, and most likely in the UK, it'll be it's eight and two and one, so it's gonna be up to 11 years. So it's a little bit longer, but still patent protection is most often gonna last beyond that. So a patent lasts 20 years from when it's first filed, the non-provisional, and there's a possibility of getting an extension for the time that you lose while you're in the regulatory approval process up to five years, as long as that five years doesn't bring your overall patent term beyond 14 years after approval. So generally you can get up to around 14 years or longer for patent protection. So obviously you have more time on the market and for anything that's you know a blockbuster drug that's making a billion dollars a year, just a day or a week on the market is gonna be an enormous amount of money. So that's the biggest one. But the other one would be just the protection that you get, of course, is a protection that extends to any use of or anything that could you know fall under the claim of the patent. Whereas data exclusivity would just prohibit somebody from using your data to file for you know a similar drug application at the FDA, but they could still you know use what's covered by your claim in, in some other way. They just can't rely on the data that you have at the FDA. So it potentially covers you know a lot more activity that you can prevent somebody from from doing. The difference between a composition of matter claim and the other types of claims one can receive are you know, pretty significant depending on what the claim language like ultimately is when you compare. But a composition of matter claim, I mean, it covers any use of a compound. Anytime that compound, you know, would exist somewhere, if a person has that compound, that's going to be infringing. So, it, you know, it could really can be any use of it or, or any possession of it, even, you know, manufacturing where it's, you know, a byproduct or the ultimate product could infringe that claim. With a method of use claim, it's going to be 
really limited to just the use of that. And if it's treatment of a specific indication, separate indication may not and you know generally wouldn't infringe that particular use. So why don't we start discussing ATI's 10 development program and six enabling technologies? Yeah, so when we looked at these programs, it's quite striking that around half of them, so I think around five out of the 10 underlying molecules that are being explored, the drug, sorry, they're not actually psychedelic in nature. So while in the psychedelic space, we bundle things like ketamine, which is more of a dissociative, and MDMA, which is an empathogen, into psychedelics, even taking that into account, only half of these programs are psychedelic in nature. So I think, you know, it's just worthwhile pointing that out because I think a lot of people think of Atai as, you know, a pure play psychedelics company. So Perception Neuroscience is looking at our ketamine for treatment-resistant depression. It's not the only program in Atai that's looking at this indication. There's actually a few, but this one's perhaps the furthest along. So I think, Michael, you could give an overview of our ketamine. Yeah, sure thing. So just to take a step back, Arketamine is one of two isomers of ketamine, which is the more well-known anesthetic that has been recently used as an antidepressant. And so ketamine, you can think of it of a mixture of arketamine and esketamine, where the comparison would be to your right hand and to your left hand, in that they're superimposable on each other, but they're not mirror images. So they actually have different characteristics where they interact with slightly different pharmacology. S-ketamine, also known as Spravato, is a marketed internasal spray by Janssen, which is a uh, family company of Johnson & Johnson. And that was approved for treatment-resistant depression about two years ago now. They made the decision to go with S-ketamine as opposed to R-ketamine based on some preclinical evidence, but now it's appearing that R-ketamine might actually be a superior molecule, in part because of its improved safety profile. Ketamine is known for causing dissociative effects, and those appear to occur consistently with S-ketamine as well, but there's some good evidence that indicates R-ketamine will be safer in that it has less dissociation. As far as where they are in development, Perception just recently completed their phase one trial of Arketamine and are presumably in the planning stages of a phase two trial. And it's interesting that Perception was originally founded by the co-founder of Gilgamesh. And what that means is that Perception was basically one of the first successful exits that a psychedelic medicine company had in the space. I think another interesting thing to add here is that this is a real success too for Atai's ability to spot a good opportunity to bring something in by licensing. And we can talk about some of their other in-licensing programs and then also turn it around and license it back out at quite a profit. The r program was first really Kenji Hashimoto, a professor and researcher at Chiba University, had published and filed applications covering r and R-ketamine for a variety of uses. That program and Chiba University's owned patents and patent applications were licensed by Perception for very low amounts, actually. So they disclosed in their S1, it was an upfront license fee of just $55,000, $40,000 in annual license fees, milestone payments of just $1.2 million with low to mid single digits tiered royalties. And they stated in their S1 that they've paid in total so far $200,000. Otsuka in licensing from a tie perceptions program, which covers r specifically for treatment prevention, diagnosis of depression in MDD and TRD, and it appears only in Japan, had an upfront up payment of $20 million with $49 million in milestone payments, including commercial milestones up to $66 million and royalties from the low to high teens on future sales. So clearly the, the program that they brought in for quite a low amount of money, they've you know, turned around, filed a couple other applications, uh, you know, some time has passed and obviously Jonathan Sporn's hand and, and others hand, you know, the, the work in the meanwhile, and then license it out successfully looking at it financially to a you know, big pharmaceutical company. So this, you know, is a, Interesting example of that strategy, that licensing strategy at work. So next company is Demerex, and we featured Deborah Marsh, uh, Demerex CEO, in the last business trip episode. So we're not going to cover that one in detail. But I think, Graham, you have a couple of uh, interesting thoughts around their IP strategy. Yeah, and I won't rehash what Deborah Marsh said, and she had a lot of great points. So I would certainly recommend any listeners to go back and listen to that. I've, listened to it last night and was very entertained by some of that backstory. One of the things I thought was no notable just for Demerex is having, you know, reviewed patents in this area, seeing the number of patents that were listed in Atai's S1 made me realize that I think this is going to carry over to some of the other programs I have too. But 
the only patents that need to be listed in the S1 are certain specific ones that are that are laid out in the you know the regulations that the SEC has. But there are only you know a certain number of material ones to particular aspects of the business. So, for instance, with Demerex, what's listed in the S1 is an issued patent and several pending ones in the U.S. and, and several other international pending ones. But Demerex has quite a number of other granted patents and pending applications on ibogaine for indications other than opioid use disorder, which are the indications for the patents they list. They have everything from ibogaine for pain, depression, PTSD, anxiety, impulse control, alcohol dependence, nicotine addiction, other substance use disorders, food cravings, violence and anger. So quite a number of other ones that aren't listed in the S1. Also, Deborah Mash, she's a named inventor on quite a number that cover nor ibogaine, and those aren't listed in the TIES S1 either. So I think it's important if people are looking at the S1 for like a you know a list of patents that a TIE might have just to recognize that you know, these are the patents that are related to the specific clinical programs, but they aren't the you know, full list of all applications that may be owned or in licensed or otherwise be related to just a tie. But beyond that, I mean, I think those are the sort of main issues that I kind of thought were relevant around Demerax. I mean, the only other one that, you know, maybe would note would be there's an interesting angle with some of their patents that aren't listed, which is the fact that they carve out particular patient populations from treatment. So for instance, the patent that covers depression carves out patient populations for patients who are addicted to cocaine or opiates. As a patent lawyer, uh, that's something that jumps out because there's this patent doctrine around inherent anticipation and what's called. So if like a person received Ibogaine and that person's depression was relieved, even if that wasn't the reason that person received Ibogaine, that could... Uh, anticipate and cause an, a claim on Ibogaine to no longer be novel if it's filed later. So I think this is a reflection of the fact that the prior art in the area around Ibogaine was really specific to treating substance use disorders. So in filing these other applications on things like depression or, or violence and anger, for instance, they've carved out the sort of the reasons that a, a person would have taken Ibogaine in the past, or at least at that that treatment would have been recorded or published in the prior art. One other aspect of the backstory that's interesting to, to note is some of Howard Lotsoff's work and some of his use of Ibogaine, and you know, he had a foundation that he started. That came to the attention of Stanley Glick at Albany Medical Center, who recognized the potential for using Ibogaine to treat substance use disorders, but also recognized the fact that Ibogaine use itself caused a number of problems in certain patients. It could cause cardiac arrhythmias that were potentially fatal. So Stanley Glick teamed up with a medicinal chemist, Martin Kuhn at the University of Vermont, and they created and tested about 60 compounds looking for an Ibogaine derivative or analog that would have the same benefits treating a substance use disorder without the side effects, and specifically without the side effect of cardiac toxicity, and also potentially without the hallucinogenic side effects. And they found a number of them. One of them was 18MC. 18MC, some people may have heard of because that's the lead compound that MindMed has in clinical trials now for treatment of substance use disorder. And MindMed has some applications that they've licensed or I suppose purchased from Steve Glick. And those acquired patents are expiring in the next uh, year and a half or so. It's also interesting to note that some of Demerex's patents on Ibogaine also cover Ibogaine derivatives. Um, many of them explicitly also cover 18MC. So it's interesting to, to see that, you know, that the patent office often grants things that are arguably overlapping rights. And that's something I think we may see more of as we see more patents published in these areas. And, you know, those will have to be fought out or, you know, whether they're fought out in litigation or they're fought out just in corporate boardrooms and companies have to license their patents to each other. Okay, so let's move on to the next company, Viridia Life Sciences, which also seems to have quite some competition. So in terms of this program, Viridia aren't the only company looking to develop DMT for a depression indication. So they're looking at treatment-resistant depression, but Small Pharma, which London-based Small Pharma, which recently listed on the TSXV with the ticker symbol DMT, is kind of becoming a heavy hitter in the commercialization of DMT for depression. They're looking at DMT for major depressive disorder. MindMed is also in a more secretive way, looking at DMT. Algenon is looking at DMT in, in the use of the treatment of stroke, uh, both acute and, and in terms of recovery from strokes. Entheon and Celera are both also looking at DMT. So DMT is one of these molecules, a bit like 5-MeO DMT, that's suddenly seen 
a groundswell of interest from companies in the space. I guess I would just add that the reason DMT and 5-MeO DMT are getting so much attention is because of their short acting nature and the larger concerns about the cost effectiveness of psychedelic assisted therapy and the requirements to therapists and quite a lot of resources utilized. So with a shorter acting compound like DMT, 5-MeO DMT, where the whole drug session itself is under an hour, um, those are some advantages that companies are clearly looking towards, but are also somewhat unfounded in the clinical literature. Okay, let's discuss next company, Revixia Life Sciences. Michael, when I was reading about Revixia, they have this drug, Salvinorin A. Can you Speak a little bit about what, what's salvinorin. So salvinorin A is the main um, psychoactive ingredient in the salvia divinorum plant, which was historically used by being ingested orally by the Mazatecs of Mexico for religious purposes, and also has a history of use as a recreational drug. Although in that case, it's typically inhaled, either smoked or vaporized. And it's what some might consider an atypical psychedelic. The technical classification is dissociative hallucinogen. So it has some similar properties to ketamine, but not altogether. It is extremely short acting in the range of 15 minutes, and it causes perceptual changes and has other psychedelic qualities. But the overall experience is quite dysphoric or unpleasant. From a pharmacology standpoint, it's different than other psychedelics by mainly acting it's at the kappa opioid receptor, which is in itself a separate receptor from where conventional opioids that most people are familiar with ACT. And so it has some interesting effects in that it helps reduce opioid dependency, or at least anecdotally, that seems to be the case and have some pain management qualities. And there is some evidence that it has antidepressant effects, which is spurring the interest of Revixia since they seem to be targeting treatment resistant depression. And just to add uh, one last point, there is recent research out of Johns Hopkins that Salvinorin A has very similar effects on human brain functioning that are strikingly similar actually to those of other psychedelics. So it may not be all that different, but the main differentiator is the fact that the experience is so short and considered fairly unpleasant. So one of the things you mentioned is that it is a atypical psychedelic. And so the typical psychedelics are mostly tryptamines and phenethylamines and belongs to a different family. Yeah, exactly. So the chemical structure itself is quite different from the psychedelic classes that you named. And both of those work by primarily activating the serotonin 2A receptor. And so salvinorin A does not seem to be mediating its effects through that, although the overall research on its pharmacology is still somewhat unclear. Okay, the last psychedelic program that Atai has is Empath Bio. Michael, can you speak about that program? So yeah, Empath Bio is an interesting venture on their part. But one interesting fact about them is the recent partnership with Bionomics, another pharmaceutical company, and their lead candidate, BCN210, which there isn't much publicly available information about them, but they were granted a specific designation called Fast Track designation by the FDA for the treatment of PTSD. And so the intention of that partnership is to combine Empath Bio's MDMA derivative with the BCN210 molecule to try and treat PTSD without the requirements of psychotherapy that are a part of MAPS MDMA-assisted psychotherapy model. And so that's a point of differentiation where not only are they using a different MDMA-like molecule, but are also trying to deliver it without the resource-intensive nature of psychotherapy. Okay, so let's discuss a few of their non-psychedelic programs. Let's start with CURES. So CURES is exploring a deuterated metragenine molecule for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Graham alluded earlier to the deuterated status of the molecule, but metragenine is one of two active molecules from kratom or kratom. Some people pronounce it differently. It's the Mitragena speciosa plant that's native to Southeast Asia and Thailand, and its effects have been shown to be similar to opioids, but also with some stimulant effects, depending on the dosage. The pharmacology is not well understood, and it, it may have its own dependency issues, but it's been traditionally useful for pain management and opioid withdrawal. And human research is not currently allowed with the actual kratom plant in the U.S. based on certain FDA restrictions, but through cures and the use of the isolated active ingredient, metragenine, they're able to study it in humans. 
And also what's interesting about Cures is the two founders of Cures and the founder of Perception Neuroscience, Jonathan Spawn, are now at Gilgamesh, uh, which just recently closed their $27 million Series A. So there's an interesting that both exits, the founding teams are, are now at Gilgamesh. It is a very, very small psychedelic medicine world. Maybe one other kind of interesting point of trivia is that Kratom and the active compounds in it were the, the DEA uh, issued a intent to schedule them. And then after I think tens of thousands of people sort of wrote in, they decided to withdraw their intent. I believe it's the only time that's ever, ever happened that something was threatened to be put on schedule one and then removed based on really the desires of people who were primarily, it seems from you know, what I understand of the letter writing campaign, using Kratom themselves to, to manage their, their pain and wanted to have access to the natural compound. And there have been some attempts over the years to try to bring something to you know, through clinical trials. But for now, at least people do have access, except for in six states, although of course it's fairly easy to order anything off the web to have access to the Kratom plant. I guess another example would be Dialex, right? Where it comes from CBD, which is also available and can be commercialized freely. Yeah, that's a great example. And I mean, I think part of the reason of bringing something through clinical trials, of course, is you can have your insurance cover it. Epidiolex, the list price, I think, is $1,200 something dollars per 100 milliliter bottle. Of course, $1,200 is a lot more than you would pay to buy CBD at your dispensary. I mean, the CBD that you buy through GW Pharma is going to be you know, GMP CBD, and you can be sure that you are getting the exact dosage amount that you think you're getting, uh, unlike probably most of what you would find at a dispensary or ordering online, but certainly the, the price difference is there. So, you know, there's obviously a benefit to getting something FDA approved so you can potentially get it covered by insurance, but that's itself uh, certainly a whole nother process and there's no guarantee. Okay, so let's discuss the last company in the non-psychedelic programs, Recognify Life Sciences. So I guess one thing that's interesting about Recognify Life Sciences main program for drug and development is that it's targeting a, a cognitive impairment in schizophrenia, which is a huge area of unmet need. So to take a step back, schizophrenia is divided into three main classes of symptoms, positive symptoms. So what you might associate like auditory hallucinations or delusions of grandeur. There are negative symptoms, which are the reductions in emotional expression or loss of interest. And then the last category is the cognitive symptoms, so memory and thinking. And conventional antipsychotics are only good at addressing those positive symptoms. So there's a huge need for drugs that address both negative and or cognitive symptoms. And in that sense, this venture is interesting because there's really nothing there available for patients with schizophrenia for their cognitive symptoms. Perhaps it's interesting to note that this program and 10 issued patents that cover it were licensed in from Allergan for an upfront payment of half a million dollars and a mid-single digit royalty if they ever make sales revenues on it. The program we didn't discuss is Campus Pathways, and that's because Atai actually doesn't consider Campus as one of their 10 development programs. They consider Campus as a strategic investment. As a reminder, Campus is in phase two clinical trials for a program studying psilocybin therapy for treatment-resistant depression. So Atai invested in Campus in August 2018. Today, they have 21.6% ownership in Campus, which is around $330 million at Campus's current market cap. So, you know, if, if even without th their own uh, programs and what they are currently developing, they have this ownership in a public company that's already worth around $330 million. Why don't we discuss a little bit their enabling technologies? And I found this fascinating since it's quite unique also, and it's different than uh, how most psychedelic medicine companies are, are going to market. So why is this important for Thai? Why are they acquiring and developing enabling technologies? So I think we're seeing a lot of companies in the space now looking to bring digital therapeutics in, uh, into play, uh, looking at new drug delivery mechanisms. And what Atai has done here is instead of entering into a feasibility agreement with a company like Intel Jenks, who creates oral thin films and other delivery mechanisms. So instead of just entering into an agreement with them, like a company like Cybin did, they've actually taken 
uh, an equity position in the company uh, to have control over it. So what that does is they can use it as a service for the other companies. And, and things like entheogenics biosciences, which is one of these enabling technologies, this is AI-based drug discovery augmentation. So using AI to accelerate the ability to identify candidates that would be worth taking into clinical and human clinical trials. So, you know, technologies like this, other companies are relying on third parties, contract research organizations and deals, whereas Atai is really trying to bring that in-house. One point that is interesting on this topic is this calendar year thus far, Atai has spent $1.4 million, according to the S1, on acquisitions or strategic investments in four of these enabling technologies. That's obviously a, a really small amount of money, you know, compared to the, the projects that they're investing in. So that either says a lot about Atai's ability to negotiate these milestone-based payments, where they invest a very small amount up front and then invest the rest through commitments through when milestones are met, you know, or, you know, that someone who's being more pessimistic could suggest that, you know, there's very little uh, to these companies, they're very early stage, and they're acquiring the team members more than the projects themselves. I guess that when we talk about enabling technologies, that means a few things. Josh, you mentioned AI enabled drug discovery platforms, but also that means digital therapeutics, that means different types of drug delivery technologies and also ways to segment or stratify patients. So as if clinical trials with psychedelics is not complicated enough by a variety of factors, with Atai's interest in enabling technologies or digital therapeutics to pair with some of their drug candidates, there's an added level of complexity as far as the regulatory burden. So drugs and devices typically have distinct regulatory pathways, and the combination of the two is a relatively new phenomenon that most regulatory bodies are still trying to figure out how they would handle. All right. So pretty much half of the S1 is actually dedicated to listing risks that a tie will face after they go public. So why don't we talk about some of the um, most interesting or uh, noteworthy risks that they mentioned? And one of them is that the scales that it takes to be a drug discovery and drug development program are very different than the skills that it takes to commercialize a drug. I think, you know, there's a broader kind of consideration here about the cost efficacy of these drugs. And, you know, that's something that MAPS, as it's moved towards later stages and completed its first of two phase three trials, has had to start considering. So MAPS published, I think, late last year, a cost effectiveness study on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, which showed, I think, $103,000 of savings per person over, over a 20 to 30 year period. So I think at the moment, there's just such a focus on regulatory approvals. Um, as time goes on and, and these drugs move through their, their respective phases, there will be more of a focus, not just on marketing, but also on cost effectiveness uh, of the therapy. And you know that's why we're starting to see some, some uh, companies, as, as Michael mentioned, looking at 5-MeO DMT and, and DMT itself. Because of the shorter duration of action, other companies are taking perhaps arguably more dystopian angles and are looking to kind of remove the, the human aspect, so removing the therapist from the situation. You know, what, whether you put the therapist on a screen, in the case of telemedicine, or whether you create a kind of AI human to do that therapy itself. So there's many ways that companies are looking at cost cutting. But overall, the, the main focus, in my opinion, is really going to shift from approvals to cost effectiveness and convincing regulators and insurance companies of that cost effectiveness. It also, you know, that differs Based on in North America, we see insurance companies having to be convinced of the cost effectiveness. In the UK, the bar is a bit higher. We have a, a state healthcare provider, and ultimately it's funded by the government at the time. So they're often thinking on shorter timeframes in terms of cost effectiveness. So things like Spravato, Johnson & Johnson's esketamine product for depression, wasn't approved for use or wasn't recommended for use in the UK because it was deemed to be too expensive based on the, the cost-benefit analysis. So I think you know these considerations are going to become a lot more prevalent and Atai outlines them in their S1. But I think what's so useful to investors uh, in the S1 is looking at the risks that Atai outlines and identifying which ones are unique to Atai and which ones you know, are relevant for the entire sector. Josh's most recent point about differentiating what's unique to Atai and what is one that isn't and speaks to the lack of innovation in mental health drugs in general is how difficult it is to find a drug that shows some efficacy in preclinical or animal models where there's always a risk that that doesn't translate to humans. And then the subsequent need to show that the therapy is safe. And finally, the biggest hurdle being showing that it's effective. And so as you move through the clinical trial process, 
an increasing number of molecules fail that next step. And so it's appropriate that they highlight how big a risk that is with all their ventures, just because of how difficult it is to develop a central nervous system acting drug. Graham, they also mentioned a few IP risks. Can you talk a little bit about what caught your attention? Yeah, I'm happy to go through those. I mean, I will note maybe at the outset that the risk section, part of the reason it's so big is because the S1 can create liability for a company if there are any material emissions. So especially when it comes to risk, there is a lot of boilerplate in there. And that's really true with the IP section. But broadly, I mean, the types of risks that anyone in this space faces are really two. One is not being able to get patent protection on your own products, which means competitors can develop and commercialize competing products without you, know, you having any means of preventing them through the exclusivity of a patent right. And then the other is your own products could potentially infringe the patent of another. So just generally, at least a third of all applications don't end up being granted for one reason or another. They have to maintain these patents after they've been granted. And then of course, you know, there's a risk just enforcing a patent. It's difficult, it's expensive. For things that are in licensed, sometimes it's difficult to even have the right to be able to enforce that patent against somewhere else. And the sort of other bucket of just having potentially a product that can infringe the claim of another, you know, there's, as they point out, patents aren't published for 18 months. So there's a lot of unknowns out there about whether or not somebody has something that covers the product that you're working on. And one of the things they note is litigation just itself can be a weapon. So they say that many companies in biotech and pharmaceutical industries have used IP litigation as a means to gain an advantage. So just the threat of litigation itself and the uncertainty of litigation itself is often used for for competitive purposes. It, en it enables a competitor who sues you to ask for production of all your documents. They can obtain like trade secret documents and a lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise want to reveal, find out information about your projects that are more secret compounds you're working on. Graham, do you think it's likely that patent litigation will happen in psychedelic medicine? I mean, if it goes the way of other industries, it's much more likely that it will happen than it won't. Yeah, that's what happened in the early days of biotech. That's what's always happened in pharmaceuticals and most emerging industries, there's a period of time where there's a lot of competing patent litigations uh, against each other. I mean, both because, you know, they can be used to really prevent a competitor from launching a product or competing directly with you, but also because they can be used as a way of getting documents from a competitor, getting witnesses from a competitor to, you know, take depositions of and get information from. So one last risk I wanted to mention in regards to the combination of a drug and a medical device that Atai seems to be interested in is that with the inclusion of companion diagnostic tests or some form of digital therapeutic, there is the requirement that they obtain coverage and reimbursement for that additional device on top of the drug itself. And that paradigm may add some additional risk when it comes to obtaining reimbursement, which ultimately dictates the success of a drug or a therapy. So one other risk that isn't really covered by the kind of standard format of the S1 is this fact that there's a lot of overlap within their platform. So for example, they have three drug candidates that are targeting opioid use disorder. They have ibogaine, noribogaine, and deuterate dimetrogenine. And they also have three candidates looking at uh, treatment-resistant depression, so DMT, arketamine, and salvinorin A. And in addition to that, they also have their 21.6% equity stake in Compass, which is looking at psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. So there's quite a lot of concentration there with six of their drug candidates looking at two indications. So when we think about, you know, I mean, that, some people could say that's good because it gives them a few shots on goal at those indications. But when people are thinking about the total addressable market, you have to remember that it's unlikely that all six of these candidates would end up being, you know, the dominant drug for any one of those two indications. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, recapitulate that point that this is an incredibly competitive landscape and these are incredibly competitive ailments that many people are trying to treat, which is, you know, good for society that we finally have a huge amount of investment in these compounds. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Josh, Michael, Graham, for your time and sharing your knowledge about the Thai. Atai is a fascinating company. They are developing therapies with a diverse assortment of psychedelic compounds. They are doing it with laser sharp execution and have been able to raise a ton of capital in a short period of time. Let's remember, they were one of the first for-profit companies to bet on psychedelic medicine, and they played a big role in attracting attention and resources to the space. With all this potential, it's still early days, 
their programs are still in clinical trials and potentially will be approved in the next few years. This is Business Trip, a podcast about psychedelic entrepreneurship. If you liked this episode, you can help us by subscribing to the podcast and leaving a review. You can tweet at us or find us on the gram at Business Trip FM. And if you're building a company in psychedelics, definitely reach out. My email is matthias at businesstrip.fm. I'm your host, Matthias Serbrinski. Business Trip is created by me and Greg Kubin. Producer and editor is Jonathan Davis. Sound design and engineering came from Zach Frank. Our theme music is by Dorian Lab, and additional music credits are in the show notes. This is Business Trip. Thanks for tripping with us, and we'll see you next time. Should I host this episode? No, you host. 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 You host. You host. No, 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 you host. Uh-uh. You host. You host. You host. You host. You host.